Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another segment of Good Manufacturing Practices in Blood Centers. Uh, I'm Ruth Sylvester, and I'm a volunteer instructor with Global Healing, and I'd like to welcome you all again this week. Today, what we're going to talk about is um, we're going to look at facilities, we're going to look at equipment, materials, which is a fancy way of saying supplies, and then some contract maintenance. Remember, the le earlier in the very first session, we went through and we compared good manufacturing practices to the um, Greek Parthenon. And what we showed was that it is the base, the bedrock of good manufacturing of, of all of donor center practices is GMPs. What we want to do today is, and, uh, and in the subsequent weeks, is we want to start looking at each of these individual um, components of good manufacturing practices. Today we're going to look at uh, premises or facilities and equipment and we're going to look at supplies which also includes contract manufacturing. So let's get started. The key concepts to understand and grasp having to do with facilities is that wherever you set up your operations it should be located in a place that's designed and constructed and maintained to suit the operations. In our case, that operation is uh, blood donor center operations, which is uh, collecting donors, manufacturing products from those product from those donors, and then distributing them to transfusion services. You should plan and lay out your the the operations ahead of time when you're setting it up. You want to make sure that you have a logical workflow. You want to make sure that you want to minimize risk. And the way you minimize risk is by having a very organized and um, one-way flow as much as possible of the operations as they go. You want to make sure that your staff and your donors are safe. And you want to be able to um, clean the equipment in the area that helps to ensure that your donors and your staff remain safe. You also, by cleaning, will maintain, uh, minimize uh, cross-contamination of the products um, so that you can assure the safety of the individual products. When you are laying out your design, let's see if I, there we go, um, you want to, to think about it ahead of time before you move stuff in. Uh, equipment shouldn't be put just where it fits. It should be planned out ahead of time. You want a one-way workflow wherever possible. And when I say one-way workflow, I mean that it comes in, step one comes in, and then it goes to step two, to step three, to step four, without going back and stepping over each other. And we'll go through a little exercise here in just a minute to uh, illustrate what I mean. Um, and then you want to validate it. You lay it out and you diagram it out um, and you look at, and as you'll see in this uh, example here, there's different colors to annotate different activities that are going on. So anyway, then you validate it. And the way you validate it is you set it up and you actually try to operate it and try to run it in the way you envisioned. And when you truly do practice that way, you may find out that what you thought was going to work may not in fact work. Um, and then after you've got it operated and going, you need to um, periodically assess it for effectiveness because things change as, as you go along. Perhaps you get new equipment or uh, some other changes or you realize that uh, maybe things would work just a little bit better if I changed it. And so you, um, you need to be willing and open to do that. So now, let's do a little exercise here right now. I have two different conceptual, well, hang on, I lost my little mouse here, there it is. I have two different concepts of uh, process design uh, and workflow. Number one, where we have, and, and what we're looking at here, this is uh, product uh, manufacturing. So what we have is an area for incoming blood, and then we have to uh, computer terminals where they're logged in, we have centrifuges, we have shakers for platelets and move refrigerators. So two different options here, um, number one and number two, and you see all, both of them have all five different areas. They have an entry and an exit. So now, 
let's think about which one would work better. So let's go to the first one. Okay, here, I lost my mouse again. Here we have the entry where blood products are brought in. And so the first place they go is they go to um, receiving our incoming products. From there, they have to be entered into the computer. So you see it comes over here to B for entry. C is where they're centrifuged. And perhaps this area was taken because it's the largest area. And you know, the centrifuges take a lot of room. From there, they go to D where your platelets will go in your shaker if you're making platelets. And then E where it goes to the refrigerator before eventually it goes out. What you see in this, in, in number one, is you see your lines crossed. You see here, you have a cross here, you have a cross here, and you have a cross there. If you imagine different people doing each of these five stages, they would be bumping into each other and running into each other. Anytime you have your process flows that are going to cross each other, you introduce risk. And when you introduce risk, um, you, um, oh, let's see, hang on a second here. There we go. Okay, let's go to the next one where we look at number two here. Same five areas, A, B, C, D, E. You entry, the blood comes in, A is, this, is um, product reception. And so here the, the products come in, uh, there we go. The products come in A, from there they are logged into the computer in B. C, they're put in the centrifuge. D, their uh, platelets are put on the shaker. And then E, they're put on the, um, in the refrigerator. So you see it's all one way process, except of course, which is marked on here, is that um, when you go to exit, you will have to come through. So instead of one, two, three crosses, you will end up with only one cross and that's when you exit out. So that's what I mean when I talk about sitting down and actually thinking through. It's more than just diagramming out what it is you want, um, the way you want things to flow. It's analyzing them and, and determining whether or not um, they are the optimum flow. So now let's look at our premises or our facility design. When, since we're operating a donor center, that's what we should think about. We really should have separate areas for each of our major functions. We should have a separate area for donor collection. We should have a separate area for uh, production and testing. And we should have a separate area for ancillary services, which would be quality and our administrative functions. The reason we want that is we, we want to, when we're dealing with our products, we want to make sure that they're in a cleaner environment. Um, when we're dealing with our donors, we don't want them back here where they can, they, they can be contaminated or they can contaminate the testing or the products. And same thing with the ancillary services. We don't want uh, people working on computers when they've just been handling samples. The other thing is you need to make sure that your space is adequate. And, and I've had the opportunity to visit um, several of your locations. And you're really very much like the United States was probably 20, 20 years ago, uh, or actually more, um, where you're so challenged for space. Not only is it cramped quarters, you know, but they just weren't designed for um, to be a donor center and you're making the best you can. But as you move forward, you want to try to improve your space. So you want to make sure that you have enough of it, that your lighting, that your humidity, that your temperature, your ventilation, all um, are, are adequate for what you're doing. The last thing you want to try to do is collect donors in a hot room and you'll see your, uh, the number of donors that pass out, number of donor reactions go up. And you want it to be secure. You don't want people to have access to areas they are not supposed to. You don't want having people having access to your records. You don't want them having access to blood products. And then lastly, you should have washing and toilet facilities. Um, not only for the staff, but also for the donors. So, what about specifically the different areas? In our donor areas, again, we want it to be separate from production and testing. And just like overall, we want it to have a very logical flow. 
We should have donors come in the door. They should be received. You want to screen the door, the donors. When you're doing screening, you want to make sure that that inner, that that area is private. Um, donors are more likely to give you true, honest answers of their health history um, when they are assured confidential uh, confidentiality. Then you have an area for collection. You don't want people being screened in the same area where they're being collected because it just jams up and you have you run the risk of getting either farms mixed up or uh, collection uh, uh, collection bags mixed up. Uh, then you have a can, what we refer to as a canteen. That's just where your donor recovers after collection. That's where you give them, you rehydrate them with water uh, and fluids uh, and perhaps a snack and then their exit. Again, as much as possible, you try to have it in a, a single uh, direction. That may not always be possible. Perhaps it'll make a loop, but you try whenever possible to do that. The other challenge you have in uh, donor collection is they're not always done in a single location. There are times where you are um, collecting in a mobile location. In the United States, almost 60% of our collections are done on mobiles. That's, that's a very high. And they go to different locations every day. They go to schools, they go to offices, they go to manufacturing plants. And when they are evaluating a location for a blood drive, um, what they look for is you want to make sure that you have enough room. You want to make sure, again, that you have good ventilation, that it's a good temperature, and that the lighting is uh, adequate. It's adequate for the donors to fill out the forms, and more importantly, for your staff to be able to see, uh, see what they're doing. You want to make sure you have access to hand washing capabilities. There are, I mean, you can certainly now you utilize the alcohol-based cleaners um, when you don't have running water, but wherever possible, you want to have hand washing. And then you want to have reliable communication because in the, uh, you know, the um, unintended time where you may have a serious reaction, you need to be able to communicate and get emergency help if necessary. And as always, you want to make sure that the safety of both your donor staff as well as your donors um, are assured. So production areas. Let's look at production areas. That's really the next logical place um, that we have. Um, you want to, again, make sure that it's secured and it has limited access. You don't want uh, non-donor center staff tra traipsing through where you're producing units. You don't want donors walking through there. Um, anytime you have um, uh, uh, people who are not trained in the areas, they can inadvertently bump something, they can move something, they can contaminate something. Um, so you really want to limit access to those who really need to be there. And then the other thing is you want to make sure that your area is organized wherever you work. And the reason, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, hold on. There we go. Uh, the reason is that the more clutter you have, the higher the risk. It's, it's the same thing with my desk. When my desk is all cluttered, I can guarantee you I'm going to lose something um, versus when I keep it organized and neat. Um, you want to keep your area clean and hygienic. Again, you want to be wiping down your counters all the time, particularly um, before and after you've been handling products, before so that you don't contaminate your products, after so that you don't contaminate your staff. Uh, product safety and staff safety are the most uh, utmost. And then you want to um, have your environment and your storage monitored. When I say monitored, you should be looking for the temperatures checked. In some cases, humidity is checked. Um, that's going to depend on whatever um, supplies that you have stored there so that um, whatever the limitations are, that's what you should, first of all, make sure that your area is capable of doing it and then that um, it's checked and recorded on an ongoing basis. And then the, sorry about that. Yeah, this one. The last thing um, is you need a quarantine area. When you're doing um, product manufacturing and testing, there are going to be products that either test initially reactive or perhaps you have questions on a donor history form. And so there's a question as to whether or not that product is truly safe. If there is anything that pops up that brings a product safety into question, then that product should be moved out of um, regular storage and put into what we in the U.S. refer to as quarantine. Um, it should be completely segregated. 
It may be in the same refrigerator, but perhaps it's on a different shelf. Perhaps it's put into a separate container within that refrigerator. Some way to truly designate it that this product is not ready for release. There's question about it. Um, at one location that I had, I just didn't have extra space and extra refrigerators. So we tagged any of our products that were um, quarantined. That way we knew that as long as that tag was on there, it was not ready to be released uh, into inventory. I am definitely having trouble and challenged with my uh, marker to my, my mouse today. Okay, let's talk a little bit about equipment. Equipment design, as with anything, we want the design of equipment. And when I say equipment, I mean uh, everything from a phoresis machine, centrifuges, to tables and um, uh, donor beds. That's all equipment in a blood donor center. You want it designed to meet its intended purpose. You want to um, minimize hazards to donors and to staff. So you want, um, let's say, counter space, for example. You want the counters at a comfortable height for whatever the equipment the, that the technician's going to be utilizing. If the technician, the same thing goes for the bed. You don't want it so high that the donor has to try to hop in it. But at the same time, you don't want it so low such that your phlebotomist is having to bend over constantly and, um, uh, and cause back pains and strains uh, for your staff. Um, and it should be, uh, and, and, and they should be made of materials that enable effective cleaning and disinfectant. We try to stay away from cloth material um, in, in the U.S., uh, and actually, that's something that came along from um, from when we started meeting EU standards because we sell a lot of plasma to the EU. Um, cloth material is very, very difficult to sanitize and disinfect after you've had a blood spill. And, um, and so wherever possible, you have material that is easy to wipe down with a disinfectant. It's ergonomically appropriate. Again, um, you want things that are not going to cause repetitive strain uh, and cause your staff to, um, to um, incur injuries. And then you want the surrounding environment to be suitable. You don't want, um, uh, let me be an example, you, you don't want um, your donor center collection stuff out in the middle of the receiving area where people can come and go and the possibility of bumping into the, the bed and disrupting a phlebotomy. Um, so your surrounding environment needs to be closely monitored. Now that is um, equipment design. Now let's look at um, equipment maintenance. Anything, any piece of equipment that is used, particularly anything that moves, um, it's going to uh, break down eventually. To minimize the breakdowns, you maintain that equipment. You should have an overall equipment policy that talks about um, how you're going to maintain your equipment, um, that you're going to abide by preventive maintenance requirements, cleansing requirements, disinfectant requirements. It should include calibration, again, cleaning and maintenance. And um, you have both scheduled and unscheduled maintenance. Scheduled maintenance is the recommendations made by the manufacturer of the equipment. It tells you um, how often you should be doing whatever needs to happen to your uh, equipment. Um, let's say for a centrifuge, uh, that you use an ABO testing, um, you may want to be, you should be calibrating that on a periodic basis uh, to make sure that the buttons you have at the bottom of the tube are of the right size and that they dislodge appropriately. We used to do that on an uh, annual basis and then we would verify the calibration uh, on a um, uh, on a quarterly basis. We would check the um, uh, the uh, RPMs or the revolutions per minute on a quarterly basis with a tachometer. Um, you should have your competent authorities requirements as well. Um, your uh, manufacturer may say that you only need to do the maintenance once a year, but if your competent 
authority, which would be your government inspection agency, says you need to be doing it quarterly, then you need to be doing it quarterly. Whichever is the most stringent is the one you have to follow. And then you should do a risk assessment. When you're doing a risk assessment, you're looking at uh, a variety of things. Perhaps you have a piece of equipment that's getting old and it's not as reliable as it used to be, then you should be doing a risk assessment on it and saying, um, perhaps we should be checking this one more frequently than we have in the past just because of its age uh, and, and wear and tear. But at a minimum, you should at least check every piece of equipment annually for all of the, do, do the a complete um, check of all of the different um, of variabilities. Uh, as again, as I said, the uh, centrifuge, that would be looking at your uh, speed or the revolutions per minute uh, that you would check with a tachometer. For a refrigerated centrifuge, that would involve also checking the, the temperatures, uh, the speed, and that it, it um, spins down your products adequately. And then anytime you do any kind of maintenance or you do any kind of calibration or you do any kind of uh, uh, quality control, you need to document that. The performance is documented. That's how you know and other people know and the competent authorities when they come in know that in fact you have been taking care, care of your equipment appropriately. Let's look uh, very briefly now at computer systems. Um, I don't know how many of you do have computer systems um, in your operation. Uh, in the United States, I would say probably 95%, if not more, of the blood collection centers are computerized. Uh, I work for America's Blood Centers, and we're an independent, uh, we're a trade organization represent, representing the independents. All of our members have computer systems. And it really is, um, it, it is a security measure that, um, I think is almost, um, it should be a minimum requirement. I think if and when you're able to go to a computerized system, uh, you should. I have certainly operated, um, if anything, just because of my age, um, yeah, I have worked in blood centers um, before computers. I have worked in blood centers. I'm a retired military, so I worked in blood centers in a deployed environment where we didn't have that. And so it really relied on you. Uh, and in my case, on me, I was the final say. Um, and no matter how good you are, I can guarantee that eventually someone's going to make a mistake and um, a unit that shouldn't be released will get released. Uh, and so if and when you can upgrade to a computer system, you should take advantage of it. Uh, and that should be your goal. Um, and the, when you have, um, when you're going to a computer system and you want to, you're looking at uh, purchasing one or implementing one or perhaps designing one yourself, you want uh, uh, to lay out a detailed description of what it's capable of um, or the capabilities that you want. Um, this is called a requirements list. Um, and then you want to make sure that if nothing else, your computer system is, is um, secure. You want to make sure that only um, that uh, results can't go in and be changed inadvertently. You want that if a unit has any kind of missing information that it can't be released. And those are probably the two biggest um, uh, issues that no matter what, that's the key to it. Um, and then it too needs to be appropriately maintained. You need to make sure that um, as security enhancements come out for software, uh, like they do for Microsoft uh, or any of the other softwares that are out there, you want to make sure that those are appropriately applied um, and that um, you, more importantly, you regularly back up. I learned this long before I uh, started working in a blood center, uh, before computerization in blood centers. I learned this when I was working on my master's thesis and uh, I lost the whole thing and I had not done a recent backup. So I'm, I'm a big, big proponent of backing up regularly. Um, and then also, as with anything that's automated, I can guarantee you that um, it's going to break down and you're gonna have to have the ability to operate in downtime procedures. 
Um, and so that's also something that you need to plan for ahead of time. It's much better to have it planned ahead of time when your computer's still operating than once it goes down and you're scrambling. And so that's um, really um, a quick look at facilities and premises and equipment. Now let's shift our gears a little bit. Let's see if I can get this. And let's look at materials management. As I mentioned earlier, materials management is simply a fancy way of saying supplies. Um, uh, only suppliers or vendors that meet uh, documented requirements and specifications should be used. Uh, in the United States, that means that they must be licensed by the Food and Drug Administration. Those rules are set out by um, the uh, FDA, and they mandate that only um, reagent supplies that they have approved be used. And then you want to make sure that you're handling um, reagents and supplies in accordance with the manufacturer's uh, requirements. Um, you want to make sure that you can assure the safety, the purity, the potency, and the quality. Um, you're like uh, the United States where you have rather extremes in your weather. In the summer it gets very hot, in the winter it can get very cold. You don't want your reagents sitting on a back dock um, in the, and freezing uh, and losing their, their, um, their reactivity. Um, so you want to have all of that laid out ahead of time. When you get uh, new materials in, new reagents in, you want to make sure that it is what you ordered and not something um, that was sent in by mistake. You want, whoops, you want to verify your, the shipping conditions, as I just mentioned. You want to make sure they haven't been exposed to extremes. Uh, you want to examine the packages for damage and defects. And then you want to document the receipt. You should have a log where you document everything that comes into your, your blood center. You document it when you received it, that you inspected it, and that it meets the requirements. Uh, yeah, that's what I just said. So, um, once you get your new reagents, you should not automatically go to start using them that day. You need to put them in quarantine, and then you need to evaluate them for acceptability. On the previous slide, you saw that where you're going to inspect them to see, well, is the package damaged, uh, and, and the, um, you know, and I'm going to, um, if it's reagent red cells, I'm going to look to see for hemolysis or contamination. Um, but you need to evaluate it for acceptability. If it's reagent red cells, I'm going to check it utilizing um, Anisir. If it's um, Anisir, I'm going to check it against uh, reagent red cells. If it's test kits, I'm going to um, check it with positive and negative samples. And then if it's sterile products, I'm going to culture it or in, if um, either cultured, make sure it's, it's sterile, or if I get a certificate. In the U.S., many of our uh, manufacturers will give us a certificate that uh, guarantees that it's uh, sterile. And then whatever the release criteria that is established, you need to make sure that all of your reagents and, and, and uh, supplies meet those. And not until they meet those will they be released from quarantine and put into, um, into use. So, storage. You want to store all of your materials, and I'm not just talking about reagents, but, but everything, your blood bags, your um, um, uh, uh, arm, uh, arm swabs and stuff, you want to store them according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Somewhere in the literature that accompanies the package insert that accompanies your reagents and supplies, it's going to tell you what is the acceptable temperature and humidity, and then you want to make sure that you can confirm the storage conditions with each new shipment. So you look at whenever you get a new shipment, as you know, then you should re be reviewing the package insert and make sure it hasn't been revised and that any of the storage conditions haven't changed. You should store your like lot numbers together. You want to be using all, well, you don't want to be bouncing back and forth between different lot numbers. And so you should store them all together. You should segregate them. Uh, mark them somehow, and then use all of one up before you move to another. 
The other thing you should be doing is making sure that you're using your oldest ones first. That way you're not using your new ones, your new uh, lot numbers with the longest expiration date. And then when you're out of that, you realize that everything has expired. You want to keep your storage areas clean and organized uh, and sanitized. And then you want to monitor your temperature and humidity. And monitoring means not only having a thermometer or a hydrometer in there, but also recording uh, what the readings are. Now, all of our reagents, whoops, sorry about that, all of our reagents come from someone, um, and those someones are manufacturers, or we call them, refer to them as vendors. You should have a minimum requirements for who's going to qualify to be a vendor. Um, and you should have a relationship that is established and defined in a contract so that these you tell to your vendor what it is you expect from them, and that they are contractually bound to meet those requirements. And the contract term should include, first of all, that everything's going to be um, manufactured in a good manufacturing practices um, um, environment. GMPs is not just for blood centers. GMPs are for any manufacturers. Uh, I don't care if they're making Tylenol or if they're making blood bags or if they're making gauze. Um, they should all be done in a GMP environment. There should be qualifications and standards for what is the minimum acceptability for, um, uh, for the product that is being made. EU certification is one such um, uh, qualification. FDA, stand, uh, FDA licensure is another one in the United States. Um, there should be quality of service and goods should be evaluated on an ongoing basis. If you have a vendor that is forever uh, constantly being late in getting you your supplies, or you have a lot of contaminated supplies, you get a lot of broke, uh, broken um, packages, then perhaps you should be looking for a different vendor that, more, that more efficiently and effectively meets your requirements. And then you want to make sure that in that contract, you tell your vendor that if you make a change, you need to notify us. If you're going to change how something is stored, if you're going to change perhaps the effectiveness or the strength of a reaction, we need to know that. And then you need to let them know that they're subject to an audit. You should have the right to go in and inspect your vendors. It doesn't mean you're going to do it, but you should have the right to do it. With um, this vendor contract, then we also want to turn our attention real quickly here to contract manufacturing. Um, contract manufacturing is, um, whoops, sorry about that. There it is. There it is. Um, it's a process where perhaps you don't do everything in, um, in the blood manufacturing process. Perhaps you don't do testing and you contract out testing to another center. That would be contract manufacturing. Perhaps you don't irradiate products, so you send your product somewhere else to be irradiated. That's a uh, contract manufacturing. So it's just like contract with your vendors, but with another uh, blood manufacturer or um, one that offers services in the blood manufacturing. When you do have part of your process being done outside of your center, then you need to have a contract, and that contract needs to spell out exactly what your expectations are, uh, what the specifications are. Uh, hang on a second, I think I got one, two, three, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, subject to, you have a written contract, you need to lay out what the specifications are, and let them know that, um, this is what I require, that I want you to operate in a GMP environment. But recognize that even though you may contract something out to someone else, you are still ultimately responsible for the safety, purity, and potency of the product. So even though um, Jim Bob may be the one that is doing your testing, it is up to you to make sure that you're, uh, you're utilizing a uh, valid uh, testing uh, operation. And so I think this might be the last slide. Yes, it, uh, nope, not quite. A couple more. 
Um, what are the contract givers responsibility? And this is the people who are your contract people, uh, your contractors. Um, they um, want to make sure that they understand all of the details in the contract, that they uh, have access to the contractor suitability competence and um, so that you can go in again and audit and check their records, um, that you can monitor the performance of the contractor and that you can um, um, monitor the in incoming ingredients, uh, materials, results, and supplies. Let's say it's testing, then you should be, you want to be able to be looking at, periodically can inspect their, um, um, the test results. Your contract should clearly uh, spell out the duties of each party, and it's not only your contractor who's going to do some things, but also what are your requirements. You want to state the responsibilities of each party. You want to specify the technical arrangements. Um, how are you going to get results back from your contract tester? And then um, also you need to let your competent authority know that you are utilizing a contract manufacturer and that contractor would be subject to competent authority um, uh, audit as well. Your contract should spirally, uh, again, clearly define the flow of information, including whenever any deviations or changes occur. Um, in an ideal world, you have uh, results are all transmitted by way of computer so that you don't have to manually transcribe information. Because I guarantee you, anytime you manually transcribe information, you're entering risk. You're introducing risk into the process because no one, no human uh, is perfect. You want to define the handling and the archiving of documents. You want to make sure that they don't throw all their test uh, um, runs away as soon as they run them and send you the results so that you can go back and audit them. And then you want to uh, specify the duties that can be sent to a third party. Um, you don't necessarily want your contractor to turn around and send your samples somewhere else to be tested by, by a third party without your knowledge that it's happening and your approval. And that is the last slide I have on the topics for today, which were um, facilities and, and um, equipment. We looked at uh, supply and materials management, and we looked at contract uh, manufacturing. And so now we'll go ahead and um, I should be available live to answer any questions that you may have from any of the material we covered today.